Christ died for nothing. All right. Good text. Uh, some of the uh, best passages of Scripture, the whole New Testament, right here in this, uh, verses 15 through 21. So, let's unpack what Paul is saying here. Uh, there's, he's saying a lot, but at the same time, he's not. I mean, it's very, very simple what he's saying, but yet, because we humans are so entrenched in our sin, it's complex at the same time. So let's look at our sheet to kind of help unpack what's being, what's being stated here and what's being said. <clears throat> the need to be justified. Okay? It has been said that the greatest needs of mankind are money, sex, and power. Now, you've maybe heard me say this before, uh, but again, it, it bears repeating again, that the greatest needs of, money are, of mankind are money, sex, and power. People will lie, cheat, and steal to acquire money. Just think about all the movies that we watch, right? <laughs> where we, we actually are rooting for the uh, thieves, right, to get money. And, and the whole idea is that they get money, then guess what? 
all will be well. There's an old, old movie called Italian Job where they steal a bunch of gold, and there's an older edition and a newer edition. And the one <coughs> newer edition, the guy's like, what are you going to do with all the clothes? He's going to buy, he's gonna buy myself a bunch of shoes. <laughs> so he buys all these, 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 uh, these unique and expensive shoes, and uh, my goodness, at the very end, he's happy. He has his shoe collection, and all is well, right? You know? And so this idea is that you just get enough wealth, and you can have everything be just perfect. Uh, also, as far as sex, marriages are destroyed, families are ruined, and jobs are lost as a result of sexual affairs and pornography consumption. And so we have all seen those situations uh, where an individual uh, will throw a whole entire life away uh, to have that feeling of being uh, of fulfillment in, in, a, in an extramarital affair. Physical fights, threatening letters, and intimidation tactics are engaged to keep another person under their thumb. So all we have to do is look on the uh, politics on the news, and you see political groups back and forth, back and forth, and all they're trying to do, many times, they're not looking for the good of the people, but they're just looking to what? Establish power over one another. And so they're trying to keep what? Another person underneath. And the, the idea is that if all of them can control the Congress and the executive branch and the judicial branch, and we can, if we can have all of that, they guess that all will be well in the land. That's kind of the mindset. Okay? But believe it or not, None of these things are considered the greatest needs of mankind. What then is mankind's greatest need? Okay, what I'm advocating for is the greatest need of mankind is not money, sex, or power. There's actually a much, much greater need. The greatest need is to be justified, to be considered right and good and whole. This, this need to be justified is so great that we take it upon ourselves to justify ourselves. So to be justified is that feeling of being what? Right, whole, complete, um, justified. And, 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 and to be centered in what? A moral rightness. Okay? And so you can see this at work in so many different ways. Uh, you see this at work so many different ways. Uh, one of the biggest places you can see it is going to be on Facebook and social media. Uh, you see these fights that develop on social media that are back and forth, back and forth, and they're both trying to prove what? That they're right. You see this in conflict in society, right? Maybe between co-workers. One co-worker will what? Uh, speak ill of another co-worker's work ethic, and then next thing you have what? You have a fight. Um, you see this uh, in an old hockey player. I remember when we played hockey back in the day. All it would take is a certain kind of look, and I can't, I don't know if I can explain it, but a certain kind of look, and then guess what? It's on, right? And uh, then fights would break out, because you look at a guy wrong, right, in a hockey, hockey rink, and then it's what? The need to justify, to be right, to be whole, to be above another person. So this need to be justified is so great that we'll take it upon ourselves to what? To justify ourselves. So we take it upon ourselves, not only <clears throat> to try to get other people to justify, but we build these empires for ourselves to justify ourselves. And so we, 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 we take, when something happens, we, we put it through the process of our filter of our mind. We filter out all the bad things about ourselves, and then we what, build and construct these views of ourselves that are righteous and whole. So that we can see it at night, that we are what? That we're good. Um, consider the last fight you've had with your spouse. I'm just thinking this last week. Guess what? Serenity was right again. Okay? <laughs> she was. How surprised. Thanks, Rhonda. <laughs> but, you know, <clears throat> so what happened was, you know, you, you know um, well, I'll just be vulnerable. Uh, uh, <laughs> we went to the fair. And what right. happened, I was good. Uh, she said, you have to be good at the fair. <laughs> and I'll, be good. I'll be good at the fair. And I was fine. I was positive. Until the guy started harassing me, telling me, come over here, I'm going to clean your shoes. I'm like, I just want to go to the fair. I just want to look at these. Boots. Come on over here. I'll make those shoes white. I'm like, Leave, I want to yell. I'm like, leave me alone. <laughs> it's free now. I'm like, it's not free. You know, I'm over here shopping my shoes. I have to talk about my shoes. I know nothing about I just bought them because they're on sale. And they just said, look how nice and white they are. And, but now you're what? It's going to be so much. I was look at your white shoes. It's my son would say, your shoes are drippy, right? And then, and then, and then all of a sudden, I'm going to have to spend some money to get my shoes to be what? To be complete and whole. Then I'm going to have to say no. And then you're going to be disappointed. And I'm going to feel shame for me. I'm like, I just don't want to do it. And so I got really cranky. <laughs> I got really cranky. And, and, and Mrs. Richard told me I was cranky. I'm like, no, I'm not. So I'm, I'm what? Justifying, right? 
just fine. And then, well, maybe I am. Maybe I am cranky, but that shoe guy made me cranky, so therefore, what? I have a right to be, what, a jerk to my family because the shoe guy, see what you're doing, the games? Yeah. We're justifying. We're, we're trying to justify. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Don't ever have to clean my shoes. <laughs> Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, world wars and, and wars between countries happen because one leader will what? This another leader. And you can have what? Thousands of people uh, shed and bloodshed and war because of a simple what? Lack of justification. Okay? All right? So, as we consider this here. So, what then is man's greatest, greatest need? The greatest need is to be justified and considered right and good and whole. It's so great that we justify ourselves. We do this by attempting to craft stories of our lives in ways that portray ourselves as good and right and salutary. Like a strainer, we strip away the bad moments of our past and elevate that which is good so that we can apply only the positive aspects of our stories to our identity. In the court of popular opinion, we gather friends that believe and uphold the version of our story, and we distance ourselves from those who threaten to topple our grand self-narrative. So the friends that we choose oftentimes are those that are going to what? Enforce the story of the justification of ourselves. We're not going to gather around ourselves people who what? Perhaps will point out our flaws. Okay? When we look at the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is all about what? grabbing what people of wisdom who are going to give you correction and rebuke, that's healthy, but the way what, the simple nature is we don't want that, so we gather around ourselves people who what, will applaud, you know, the Trinity of me, myself, and I. Okay? To make things worse, next page, and to ease the guilt of the conscience, we do righteous things to feel justified. We cross our T's and dot our I's, feeling that we are better than our neighbor. What garbage. So in other words, <clears throat> when you do something wrong in society, or to your neighbor, or your family, there's a tendency to want to want, offset the badness with a good thing, to then neutralize the badness. So we think, we think like a scale, right? So we think as a scale like this, and so if I do something bad, then I would have to do something good to what, balance it out, right? Or if I make a fool of myself in public, then I have to what? I have to portray myself as positive for the next so many months to what? Offset that. This is all the games of justification. And every single one of us in society, we all do it, even in the church. It's, just, it's, it's a part of our DNA is how we think, right? Okay? On a positive. Does, does that make sense? Anybody not struggle with this? It's, it's a part. I mean, if you really think about it, how much we do play this game, right? Yeah, part. But if we go open ourselves up to tell people how bad we are, which we are, yep. we are free then to be who we are. But when we continue to justify ourselves and lie about ourselves, because that is justifying ourselves is lying about ourselves. Yep, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a line of reality of who we are. And, and so here's the thing. So part brings a good point here. One of the reasons why we, we struggle admitting our failures is because then it, it, we leave ourselves vulnerable, in a sense, before the law, before public opinion. And, and, and so what we do is oftentimes, when we're around individuals who are very, very, very um, pushing to justify, you don't want to let yourself down because then they would get the what? The upper hand, or they talk down to you, and so forth, all of, and all that, right? Um, it, it's very, very difficult to break that, because we're all with such pressure to what, uphold yourself and looking good, right, and true, that if you are vulnerable, or if you fail, right, and you present that, then you make it lectured. And one of my, my biggest struggles as a young pastor, and I'm, I'm mid, mid-age now, but when I was a younger pastor, I would never ever want to open up about my struggles as a pastor with older pastors. Why? Because I didn't want to be talked down to for the next two days and lectured on how I could do better. I knew I could do better. I just was struggling. I needed sympathy, right? And so I would never want to open up to older pastors because I didn't want to be lectured. Well, if you just do this, 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 then you'd be happy. Okay. I'll, if I could, I would. But, you know, you see what I'm saying? So this 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 mindset is, is one, like I said, it permeates everything we do. But again, look at our sheet here. It's garbage. This is all garbage. 
This is what Paul is speaking against. So this is exactly what Paul is condemning in the Galatian church, in Galatians 2, 15 through 21. Paul, look at this. This is really tough for us to all understand, and not only us, but, but everyone. Paul states that no one is justified before God by the works of the law. No one. Okay? That means... Uh, if you are trying to accomplish being whole and right and good before God through the means of the law, you are deceiving yourself. Tragically, those who think they are justified by the law have not died to the law. And that's what Paul is pointing out. He's talking about what? Dying to the law. That is what the law is there for, and the intent where a person needs to get to is to be dead to the law. But then that brings up the question, like, what does it mean when Paul says that he died to the law? So Paul says here, what verse is that? Um, for through the law, verse 19, yeah. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God, okay? So what does it mean to be uh, dead to the law? And this is really the whole crux of what this, these verses hang on, is this concept of what Paul is saying here. So but what does Paul mean by the phrase, for through the law, I die to the law. Does Paul mean that the law dies to the Christian, as if the law for the Christian is no longer applicable? No, if he did mean this, Paul would have said the law died to the Christian. Okay. So in other words, what Paul is not saying is that you Christians, hey you Christians, you're Christians now, so the law, guess what, it's dead, it doesn't apply to you. He's not saying that. Um, many people um, believe that, both Christian faith, and that's what we call, this is a big fancy word, antinomianism. Now it comes to the word antinomianism, let me, let me write this out so we all understand it. Uh, it's anti, whoa. <laughs> let's get a little, let's, let's bring that down to a little finer point. What color do you guys want? Red? Green? Black? Red? Red? Okay, red, red. Okay, so antinomianism is an A N. Anti nomianism comes from two words. Okay, anti sounds like what? Yes. Against. Yeah. So we know what that word. And nomianism comes from the word uh, namas nomas. I'm trying to remember how how it's phrased, but it means law. Okay. So it's anti what? Anti law. So that would be considered antinomianism, anti-law, to believe that the law is dead to you as a Christian. And it's it's not. Uh, the law is good and true, as the Apostle Paul states. But instead, what does Paul say? Paul says instead, through the law, every Christian must come to the logical conclusion that when they attempt to live by the law, they cannot fulfill the law, which then brings every person to the same position. Condemned? and under the curse of the law, dead to the law. In other words, woe to Christians who pronounce the law on everyone else around them and never come to the understanding that they are under the same condemnation as those they condemn. So in other words, when we look at God's holy law, when we look at his holy law, we can look at our neighbor and we can see the speck in their eye. And no doubt about it, there are specks in our neighbor's eyes. However, you can't look at the speck in your neighbor's eye through the means of the law and not realize what? The law in your own eye. So thus, when um, Jesus says, do not judge lest you be judged, he's simply saying this. He's not saying don't judge. He's saying be careful when you judge somebody else because when you judge somebody else, that same, same judgment of the law also applies to who? You yourself. And when you apply the law to yourself, then you are going to find yourself, what? Under the same condemnation and the same judgment as they are. Does that make sense? So when you look at the speck in your neighbor's eye, underneath the means of the law, if you think you can do that, look at your neighbor and point out their sin without seeing sin in yourself, then you're going the way of a fool. Okay? You're not dead to the law. So the law, our, our Lutheran confessions state this, it says that the law always, not doesn't only accuse, but it always accuses. So the law also teaches us what's good, what's true, 
Uh, so the law teaches us that life is good, so do not murder. Why are we not supposed to murder? Because life is a gift. Don't commit adultery. Why? Because marriage is a gift. Families are gifts. Don't steal, because property is a wonderful gift given to us. Don't have covetousness, because God wants you to be content. Right? Uh, honor mom and dad. Why? Because authority is a good gift, keeps good order. So the, the, the law teaches us what is good, right, and true, how things ought to work. But at the same time, when we study the law, it will bring us all to the same conclusion that every single one of us in this room, that we are condemned under the law, that we're dead to the law, that we don't fulfill it. So you know what that does? It makes all of us in this room what? The same. And that's the reason why we do on Sundays, what do we do? We stand up and we say, I, a poor miserable sinner, have sinned and thought were indeed. If a visitor comes into the church and they stand up and they're like, I don't want to say this, then guess what? The, 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 this church isn't for them because this church is for what? For poor sinners, sinners, including Jesus. Yeah. It's not for righteous people. It's for sinners who need Jesus. Who need the righteous one, Jesus. I've made a very, very conscious effort uh, in, in both the churches I've served in Missouri Synod that when it comes to confession of sin that I walk where I do not reason, I've said this over and over, I walk down and stand at the very front of the of the pews to be what? Chief of sinners. And I'm leading you in confessing sins. Pastor Richard is what? I'm leading you in confessing that I'm the chief of sinners. And you're going to say, no, 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 we're chief of sinners. And that's, that's, right? But then we what? That's part. Stand up, put my hand on the font. And I pronounce the gospel. I get giddy, I get really excited. That's my favorite part, one of my favorite parts. <laughs> pronounce you forgiven of your sins. I hear, I hear, as I pronounce you, I hear for myself. I'm like, God be praised, right? Okay, pause that. Thoughts on that? Isn't it easy though? We want to what? You know, we want to um, just look at the sin in our neighbor, but it's really difficult to look at it in ourselves, right? Okay, thoughts on that? Yeah, we want to be good. Absolutely. What, what is, yeah, perfect though. What does Paul say in Romans 7? The very good that I want to do, yeah. I don't end up doing it. In fact, very evil I don't want to do, I end up doing that. And Paul is like, what a wretched man I am. I mean, he's, he's pulling his hair off. He's like, it's, it's, it's Paul's like saying, gosh, I, I, just, I really, I, I woke up this morning, I really, I want to do good. You know, C.S. Lewis. You guys know C.S. Lewis? I've heard of him before, The Line of the Witch in the Wardrobe, a uh, good theologian. He said once, he said that he was going to set out, he set out for, I don't know, a week or two weeks or three weeks, but his goal was, he decided, and he, he writes about this, he said, you know, I decided to myself that I'm going to work really, really hard not to be a jerk. Hmm. And so I'm going to set out for, what, a week or two weeks to really just intentionally try not to be a jerk. And guess, guess what I found out? I'm really a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and so <clears throat> we want to be good, absolutely. All of us want to be good. And Paul says that, that's the nature, that's because you're Christians, you want to be good, but because of this old Adam, we find out that what we're, what? We're not. Okay? So, in other words, um, woe to Christians who pronounce the law on everyone else, but they, what, stand, uh, fail to stand condemned under the same law. They fail to take the blame of their own eye as the spot, as they spot the speck in other people's eyes. Essentially what Paul is teaching us in Galatians 2 is that if a person wants to live to the law, <clears throat> then they are dying to God. However, if a person dies to the law, they are living to God. Hear the contrast there? Both these ways are completely contrary. They are as different as Cain and Abel. Those who believe they are living to the law, fulfilling the law into their justification, have no use of Christ have no need of Christ. They're denying the gospel. So, if a person thinks that they're crossing their T's, dotting their I's, and they're doing a pretty good job of it, and that what? They are what? A cut above the rest. Paul would say to them, well, congratulations, I guess you don't need Jesus. Ouch, huh? Ouch. So, let's try to simplify what Paul is saying in Galatians 2. Number one, everyone needs and wants to be justified. So Paul presupposes that, that this is the need to be justified. Number two, if a person seeks to be justified by the law, doing good and abstaining from the bad, they will never be completely justified because they can't do the law perfectly. Tragically, if they believe they are justified by the law, they're living to the law and dead before God. And that's essentially what's happening here in the Galatians church. The Judaizers have set forth 
a theology where it's not just Jesus, it's Jesus and their rules, and Jesus and their what? Uh, ceremonial laws and so forth, and that if they're doing those things, then therefore they're what? A little bit of cut above the rest. Number three, how about those who see the law correctly will realize how utterly and totally condemned they are before the law. They will realize that they are under a curse. As a result, they are dead before the law. As a result, they're dead before the law. There's no hope of being justified before the law. And so to be dead before the law is to realize what? I can't do it. I can't do it. Um, That is the essence of repentance, that I have fallen short. Okay? So that's, that's Paul in Romans 7. The very good I want to do, again, I don't want to do it. And, and, and Paul gets the very end. He goes, what a wretched man, man that I am. What a wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this body of sin and death? And then we get to the gospel, which is, is, is in last chapter of uh, Romans 7, and then also Romans 8, 1. There's therefore no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus, that's the gospel. And so those who are dead before the law must also hear the gospel that as a dead and condemned sinner, they have been crucified with Christ. They are dead before the law, but alive before God in Christ. Martin Luther once said this, that, said this, he said that people need to be brought to hell before they're brought to heaven. In other words, they need to be brought before the terrors of hell that they what? That they have fallen short before they can hear the beautiful gospel that Jesus does it for them. Interesting, huh? Okay. I'm going to pause there. So, thoughts on this. Does it make sense what it means to die to the law? It's not that the law is dead. It's that you look at the law and you realize what? I'm dead, I'm dead to it. Right? Which I find very, uh, you know, I support, just, just hear me out, I support having the Ten Commandments posted. Okay? I do. I think it's good. However, oftentimes when I hear people advocating we should post the Ten Commandments, you know, elsewhere, I'm like, I, I want to say, you do realize that when you uphold those Ten Commandments, and you point to them, they're good. Those Ten Commandments are wonderful, very good. But you do realize that when you post those Ten Commandments, oftentimes you're posting it for what? Those other people. Which, they need it. But guess what? You need it just as much. Okay? So how does that look when we look at the law? When we're dead to the law, and we go to our neighbor, we restore them gently. So, if I'm going to go to, uh, you know, Johnny... And he's struggling, it's very evident, he's struggling with what? A certain sin. We go, what, in humility and say, Johnny, I see you struggling with this. Guess what? I do too. Let's go and confess before Jesus. Let's hear forgiveness. Let's go to the rail together, kneeling side by side, brother to brother, and receive the forgiveness of the sins of Jesus. How can I help you? How can I pray for you? How can I, what, be at your side? As we both, what, struggle, and we both need, what, the strength of the gospel. Make sense? Any thoughts on this before we uh, round things out here? In the very, we have some questions here to, for discussion at the very end here. Well, it always, it always with, um, with the law, it So I think it's a good point, lead by example. I, I hope, and this is very, very, this is very, this, I really struggled this when I, when I was really analyzing my preaching about 10 years ago, I was kind of really concerned about preaching. I thought, okay, how do I speak about, to the flock, right? To, to, to the sheep. I'm, I'm the shepherd in the pulpit, I'm speaking to the sheep. How do I preach? You know, I felt, I always struggled. It's like, you have the law of God that you have to preach to hearers, right? <clears throat> so how do I preach that to you? And I felt, when I was preaching the law, I felt like, man, that's just so awkward, because when I'm preaching to you, it also applies what? To me. So how do I, you know, some pastors say, well, you're in the office of pastors, so it doesn't matter, you just preach to your flock. I've gotten the conviction that when I preach the law to you, uh, what pronouns do I use? We. 
I use the word you and me, we. When I preach the law, I try to put the pronoun we. That way, it's I'm including myself with you, right? As a pastor, when we talk about sin, it's we're together. But when I talk about the gospel, what do I switch to? Which which pronoun? You. Because when I talk about the word you, that's giving what? A gift. So when the laws apply to us, I want to stand underneath it with you. And when it comes time for the good gifts, right? Jesus Christ forgives us. True, absolutely. It's even better to say Jesus Christ forgives you. Because now it's giving you a gift. So in the preaching, I, I use the word we as a pronoun to include myself with you under the law. And then I switch to the pronoun second uh, uh, second person pronoun you so that I can make sure you are given the gifts. That makes sense? And so I'd say yeah, leading by example would be us uh, confessing boldly when we do sin and hearing the gospel even more boldly. And that gives a spirit of humility in a church, in our lives, that we're quick to uh, admit our failures, quick to admit our sins, and quick to apologize. Which, I might add, is really difficult. Because it goes against our need to what? Justify. justify. It goes against our need to justify. So, yeah, very good point, there, Julia. Okay, so perhaps a simple way to understand this is to ask a simple question. Am I more justified before God by doing X, Y, and Z? So, in other words, am I better off, am I a little bit more whole and right because I did X, Y, and Z? X, Y, and Z is whatever it is. If you answer yes, you're deceived. So, if I say okay, like I wasn't too too happy with the sermon on uh, this morning. It was, it was fine, the content was fine, but I thought the delivery could have been a little bit better. Let's just say I get into this this ten thirty sermon. Let's just say I just nail it, you know, a sermon. I just nail it, and I, I don't stutter. I don't have my voice doesn't give out. I have good eye contact, and and I get done with that. And you guys all come through. Everybody comes through and says, "Pastor, great sermon," you know, "Whoa, right, yeah, good sermon." You all give me high fives, and some of you guys are crying, and you're like, and then somebody's like, "Can you autograph my hymnal, Pastor?" Right? Yeah. And then let's just say. Now, if I do a good sermon, am I therefore what? A little higher in notch before God. Now, in your mind, you would think what? Yes. But the reality is no. There is nothing that I can do or you can do that will elevate us up a little higher in God's sight. Now, hear me out. Is God pleased with us when we do good works? Yes, he is. He's pleased with the good work. But he's already well pleased with you in Christ. There's nothing you can do to make God more well pleased in you by your works. Otherwise, if that was the case, then Jesus means nothing. Then it's you and Jesus. So God is 100% pleased with you in Christ. Full stop. And when you do good works, God is well pleased with the good work. But he's not more well pleased with you <clears throat> as if you what? Earned another notch in the belt higher up on the scale of what? Righteousness. And in fact, if your motivation was to get that notch, he's yep. less of those. Yeah. Exactly. Now why? Because you know what? He's spot on with it. He said, if your motivation is I'm going to do this one more notch to get God to be more happy with me, God is going to be less pleased because then what have we just done? We've said Jesus isn't enough. Right? We've said Jesus isn't enough, so I have to add a little bit to make God a little bit more happy. So spot. Is that true? Does God become less pleased with us? What's that? Does God become less pleased with us like when, when we do bad things? Or like Yeah. Are we are we God has to give us Jesus dying for sins, and we become less pleased with us. Okay, we have to think of it two ways, according to our sinful nature and according to Christ. So according, when we do sin, okay, when we do sin, the reason why sin is such a, a difficulty is sin takes us away from the gospel. So we're prone to want, we're prone to leave the God we love. Sin deceives us, it takes us away. Think, okay, think about this, the prodigal son. Oh, it's such a good start. Prodigal son, you guys know the prodigal son, right? The son comes up to the father. He says, hey dad, give me my inheritance. In other words, I just wish you would be dead and then I could get your money. What? Yeah. So, <laughs> right? Right? What? 
And, and, and so the father gives the money to the son, right? So the father gives the money to the son. The son goes off, wild living. He goes and what? He spends it on prostitutes and drugs and so forth in the wild city. And he goes completely, what, broke. And he's, what, feeding a bunch of pigs. He's at the very bottom. And then he's like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I'm right. here to go back. I go back to my father. And then he starts rehearsing in mind. I can say to my father, what? Uh, you know, I sing against you. I did this, da, 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 da. You know, maybe I could come back and work in, as a hired hand. I don't need my old room back. I could live in the barn. Da, da. He's, he's what, trying to, what? Justify. He's trying to figure things how angle his way in. Here's what's amazing. When he's walking down the road, what happens? The father sees him. Why does the father see him? The implication of the parable is that the father's looking every day for him. The father's looking out every single day for the son. And then what happens? The father takes off running. Now, for a prestigious man of that day to run, that was a no-no. Why is he running? My understanding is, as I look at this, he's running so that the son would what? Not have a second thought and turn away because he wants to send that guy. And he sprints to the son. And he gets to the son, and the son is like, you know, in rehearsal, it's like, Okay, dad, uh, you know, I, da, 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 and, the, and the father's like, basically, shut up, you're home, you're alive. My son, who I thought was dead, he's alive. And he takes his cloak, and he wraps his cloak, this beautiful cloak around the unrighteousness, the filth of his son, and puts a ring on his finger, kills a fattened calf. Now, let me ask you this. Is the son looking at the, or is the father looking at the son saying, oh, you dirty, rotten scoundrel? He has absolute joy and love that the son is home. Now, what tore the son away? Sin. So when we sin, does it grieve the Father? Yes, because sin takes us back to where we don't belong. It takes us back to darkness. It takes us back to the evil one. Sin hurts us. Put in the mindset of a father, right, and the parent towards the son and daughter. When a son and daughter are done, they, what, they, they go off, visit with many, unfortunately, many, many parents who've had children who've uh, gone astray. And I look at the parents, and many times the parents are angry, but beneath that anger, what? They're weeping. They're so sad. They want their child back. And what they wouldn't do to what? Get their child back. Right? So the father looks to us, and when we sin, it, I would say, yes, it, it grieves him because it grieves him because it hurts us. And he wants us to repent and get back to where, where we what? Where we belong as children. Right? Wait, get a comment there? That, that, so that was my point. Yeah. It's not... Displeasure and anger, even though know, God does get angry at his people when they sin, but it's more the sadness that why is it leaving. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So, if you think, am I more justified by God by doing X, Y, Z? So, if I do these things, if I think I've notched up another notch towards God, we're actually deceiving ourselves. The Christian's justification is 100% in Christ and Christ alone. The Christian does not do the law in order to be justified. That's the point. Instead, as the Christian lives this life in faith in Christ, he or she will walk in the newness of life as a fruit. Good works are not a cause for justification, but a fruit of justification. Okay? Those who live by the law are constantly trying to justify themselves. They live inwardly towards themselves. Okay? However, those who understand <clears throat> that their poor miserable sinners are dead to the law and live by faith in Christ. Living in faith, the Christian lives not to himself, but lives in Christ and in his neighbor. By faith, the Christian is caught up beyond himself into God, and by love, he descends beneath himself into his neighbor. It is true that God is well pleased with the good works of his Christians. It is not true that the Christian's good works make the Christian more justifiable for God. Okay? So, when we see good works in this church, we say what? God be praised. God be praised. When we see sin in this church, we say what? Lord God, grant repentance so that they can get back where they belong in your forgiveness and care and love with us. And then we also, when we see others struggling with sin, we say, God, protect me. Protect me from that same sin. Uh, forgive me of my sins. One of the things the Lutheran brother did extremely well in my previous denomination is that when a pastor was uh, failing, so if there's an extramarital affair or something like that, they would send out these letters and they had a red seal on the, in the corner. And every time you got it, I remember getting about four or five of them. It was 10 years of Lutheran Brother. I got four or five of these letters in 10 years. And you get it and you see it, and all of a sudden what happens to your heart? It sinks. And you open it up and you read about what? A brother pastor who is no longer in the ministry. 
but it was phrased in a way saying, the pastor has confessed his sin, he's getting the help he needs, we're working to what, restore him and his family. We ask you to pray for him, to reach out to him, to give him the gospel, to you know, to pronounce forgiveness to him, to encourage him, and also use this as an opportunity to realize too that the devil's out for you as well as a pastor. Mm -hmm. And so we got those letters, and it drove us all to what? On journeys, it wasn't like, oh, Pastor Johnson, what a dirty rotten scoundrel. It's like, no, Pastor Johnson, God help him, God help me, right? That's the spirit of humility that works as we understand this, okay? So, um, ponder these questions. We've got five minutes. Is there a different motive and attitude or spirit between those living to the law versus those living to God? What is the difference? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What do you guys say? Arrogance against humility. Yeah. Arrogance versus humility. Yep. That's very good. Any other thoughts? Is there a different motive or attitude between those living to the law versus those living unto God? Those that are living to the law aren't allowing the law to break them. Those that are living to the law are not allowing the law to break them. And so then all their efforts and goals are to what? To prop themselves up. Versus what? Confessing sin and propping Jesus up. What does Paul say, right? Philippians. I love the game he plays with the Philippians. I, I never get tired of, of hearing this. In the book of Philippians, Paul plays the game. He says this. He says, let's play a game. Let's see who's more righteous. Okay? Mm -hmm. He goes, okay, ready, set, go. How are you doing? Well, tell you what, as far as zeal, I got more zeal than you, right? Uh, as far as righteousness, better than you. As far as learning, better than you, right? And he goes to me and makes this list, and it's like this little, little, little like, cage match of righteousness. And what he's doing, he's like, he's like, I'm better than you are, right? And then he's this righteousness game, and he's one of And at the very end of the game, he's like, okay, ta-da, I beat you, I'm better than you. But just a little secret. All of this righteousness that I've accumulated, it is... Skabala! <laughs> what's Skabala? You know what Skabala means? Yeah. It's this only time, one time used in the New Testament, okay? It is, it is, the word Skabala is stronger than the word crap, and a little less intense than S-H-I-T, right? <laughs> it's right in the middle. Dumb. All of my stuff is dumb compared to, compared to the righteousness of Jesus. It's insufficient compared to the righteousness of Jesus. So what does he do? He empties himself to point to who? To Christ. Yeah, he empties himself to point to Christ. So what does it sound like? A church that is living by the law, there's going to be a lot of talk about the Christian, and how well the Christian is doing, and how great the Christian is. A church that's living under God, under the justification of Christ, there's going to be a lot of talk about Jesus, and the justifying work of God, and how God is gracious to us as adopted children. If we Christians are to be dead to the law, does that mean that the law does not apply to us Christians? No. Because we still have what? The simple old Adam. Right? We're still the simple old Adam. Okay, number three. Describe a church that lives to the law by works of the flesh versus a church that lives unto God by faith in the Son of God. How do they differ? How are they the same? Do they sound, look, and function the same? So the difference is this. Both churches, if you come in from the outside initially, they may be doing the same what? Good works. They still may be doing the same, very same good works. But as Wade rightly pointed out earlier, the motive is what? Completely different, right? One is done, what we heard this morning in the sermon, one is gonna be done from a spirit of fear, and one's gonna be done from a spirit of gratitude. One is gonna be the spirit of what? Trying to earn, and one is gonna be done from a spirit of what? gratefulness to what has been given. Does that make sense? Okay. We have one minute. Any thoughts on these, these questions? Yeah, wait. When, when it said you're dead to the law, I don't need to understand that that means we have been crushed totally by the law. Yep. All we are is a That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yep. Uh, the Word of God is is conveyed as a two-edged sword. What is it? A two-edged sword. It, there's a two-fold to it. 
it cuts down the sperm egg white to enliven. Hosea says this, right? Hosea says that he kills to make alive, right? God kills us according to the law to make us alive under him. And uh, this, is, this is exactly what Paul is advocating for. Um, so at the same time, uh, this is very, very difficult. It's extremely difficult because it's very, very personal to us because it, what, destroys our own self-justification. And at the same exact time, it is so good because it is the gospel we need and it's freedom and assurance in Jesus at the same very exact same time. And so, um, God bless us as a church. May the Lord uh, continually crucify us unto Christ and may we be what quick to confess our sins and even more bold. I mean, that's the thing about this, guys. We can confess our sins to each other, but even better, we can confess Christ into each other's ears. We can confess the boldness of the gospel into each, into, into each other's ears. That you are forgiven. You're forgiven in Christ. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. We are at 1016, so let's stand and pray. <laughs> Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Thank you, everyone.